Thank you all so much for having me. Um, apologies if it's a little bit dark here. I am in the United States, so it's uh, rather early. But today I'm going to be talking to you about climate change and infectious diseases, reviewing evidences and research trends across the last five years. Um, again, my name is Paige Vandiverst and I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech. So climate change and infectious diseases, we know are two phenomenon that have massive impacts across all major geographic areas and across almost all biological systems from uh, severe weather patterns causing more uh, fatalities and injuries to impacts to water availability and quality. We know that climate change can have massive impacts to human health. We also know that the life cycle and propagation of many pathogens are intimately linked to climate. We also know that humans do not exist inside of a vacuum. We interact with hundreds of different species every day, and we know that when climate impacts where and when different animal species live, it can impact the pathogens that they carry as well. So host distributions can be altered by climate change. We also know that the global burden of infectious diseases is not distributed equally across the globe. If you look at this map where darker colors indicate more infectious disease burden, you're going to see a trend of countries in tropical or subtropical environments, countries that have more limited public health infrastructure or countries that experience persistent geopolitical conflict are bearing a higher burden of infectious disease than more well-developed countries in temperate areas. We also know that climate change impacts are not distributed equally across the globe. Again, here showing darker colors signifying higher climate change impacts, countries that have higher human densities, countries, and again, those tropical and subtropical ecosystems bear the brunt of climate change impacts. And in terms of neglected tropical diseases, we know, or many of you know, that neglected tropical diseases span a variety of different pathogen types from uh, viruses to helminths. So it's important for us to understand how climate change impacts all diseases and what research has been done on these specific types of uh, pathogens. And if we look at a map of people requiring interventions against ne neglected tropical diseases, we'll again see that there's a trend of some countries experiencing a higher burden than others. Again, some of those same areas that are at high risk for infectious disease impacts and climate change impacts are also the ones that are bearing the heaviest burden for neglected tropical diseases. So what we wanted to do in order to understand what research has been done on climate change and infectious disease and what the current trends are in that field, we wanted to conduct a to conduct a systematic scoping study, which allows you to look at the current landscape of research, identify research questions, current trends in research, and also collate, summarize and visualize data from often disparate fields that are sometimes not connected. And this also gives us a roadmap forward so we can understand what we have done, what we haven't done, and where we need to go in the future. So that's exactly what we did. I and my co-authors gathered every piece of scientific literature that we could from the year 2015 to 2020, so the most recent pre-pandemic period of research, from all available data sources such as Clairvoyant, University Libraries, PubMed, Web of Science, and we looked to see what the current trends are in that field. However, after we looked at the initial over 10,000 publications that we got during this period, what we found is that only about 621 of them actually fit our inclusion criteria and assessed climate change impacts on infectious diseases in an empirical manner. So what this told us was that there's a lot of literature using climate change as a keyword, and they are maybe not exactly assessing climate change, but maybe climatic variables like temperature or precipitation, but not how that that variable has changed across time. We then extracted the data both on the diseases being studied and the individuals doing the research to assess both study and authorship trends. We then collated and assessed the trends that were present. So one of the big results from this study was that over half or 59.6% of the articles studied during this period reported that climate change was having a definitive impact on the disease system that was being assessed. Only 8% of the papers found that there was no impact of climate change on the disease system that they were studying. Something interesting that we found, though, was that about 33% of the papers reported a possible or potential impact of climate change, but they could not say one way or the other if there was a definitive impact or not. 
So looking at those papers that did report a climate change impact of some kind, we found that 81% of them reported that climate change was increasing the burden of the disease system they were studying. Now, this could be an increase in the total suitable area for that pathogen. It could be an increase in vector capacity. It could be an increase in the uh, propagation rate of a vector. Um, it's somehow making the, the system worse or the situation worse. Um, there was 11% of the papers, however, that identified that climate change was actually going to decrease the burden of that infectious disease. Now, this could be an example where areas in Africa will become too hot for the plasmodium that causes malaria to continue to exist inside of some vectors. And then again, we found 8% of the papers that reported no impact of climate change on the disease system. So what this means for neglected and tropical neglected tropical diseases, um, which many of you study, is that based on this subset, we are likely going to see an impact of climate change on the disease systems that you study. And based on this subset, it's very likely that that disease system could be augmented or increased in burden based on this subset. We then wanted to look at where research was occurring to see if we could un ascertain if there's an equitable distribution of research across space. And when we looked at the areas that had more research conducted in them, we noted that countries that had higher populations had more research, which makes sense, more people, more researchers. However, when we corrected for population and we looked at research effort per capita, a more um, obvious and slightly concerning trend appeared where you can see that countries like Canada, Norway, and Australia, areas that are far away from the equator uh, in more temperate regions, were receiving a disproportionate amount of the research effort. However, countries in uh, tropical or subtropical areas, the ones that we know are at greater risk, were not as well assessed. So again, if we look at this map of emerging infectious disease risk, you'll see that these countries that have higher human densities in tropical areas um, with higher mammalian biodiversities, areas that have persistent landscape change, as well as climate change impacts are at greater risk. So if we kind of toggle back and forth between this map of research effort and the map of risk, you'll see that these um, areas are not exactly overlapping in the way that we would like them to. We looked at the exact animal taxa that were being studied during this period as well, um, and overwhelmingly it was humans, um, which makes sense. Human health drives many research efforts. However, there was also a very large emphasis on arthropods. Um, however, other vectors or organisms were not as well assessed during this period. We then looked at the specific transmission types being assessed during this period, and overwhelmingly it was vector-borne diseases followed by food and waterborne pathogens. However, other types of transmission, more directly transmitted diseases, not as well represented. And then when we looked at the specific diseases being assessed, um, there were over a hundred different diseases that were assessed during this period. Um, not all of those are listed here. This is only the top 20 or so. But again, uh, things like malaria, dengue, Lyme disease, Zika, chikungunya, those uh, vector-borne, specifically mosquito-borne pathogens were very well assessed during this period, followed by things like diarrheal diseases um, or cholera. Um, however, again, more directly transmitted pathogens or wildlife pathogens not as well represented. Looking at specific vectors, again, mosquitoes uh, were very well assessed during this period, followed by ticks. Um, however, things like kissing bugs or mites were not as well assessed. Um, very few publications looking at those, uh, the impact of climate change on those vectors. So why exactly was there such an overwhelming um, assessment or emphasis on vector-borne diseases during this period? Well, we know that vector-borne diseases account for more than 17% of all infectious diseases, causing more than uh, 700,000 deaths annually. We also know that vector-borne diseases are the fourth leading cause of death for children under the age of five. We also know that vector-borne diseases have heavy, heavy economic impacts, especially to countries that bear the brunt of the burden of infectious diseases, um, not just in morbidity and mortality that occurs in those areas, but also in preventative measures that countries put into place to try to reduce the burden of infectious diseases. We also know that there are clear links between climate and vector prevalence. It's very easy to understand how factors like temperature, precipitation, humidity impact vector capacity or vector prevalence because 
things like mosquitoes can be studied in both laboratory and field settings. However, when you're looking at um, how things like temperature and precipitation impact more complex vectors like birds or mammals, there are many lurking variables that can be present. So it's a little bit more difficult to draw the links between climate and the prevalence of those kinds of vectors. We also wanted to look at authorship trends, so not just where research was being conducted, uh, but who was doing that research. And again, here, darker colors are signifying more authors from those areas. Uh, and these blue dots represent the institutions that were most published during this period. And so those were in countries like China, the United States, and Australia. So again, what we found is that authors generally tended to do research in the countries that they were affiliated with, with a couple of notable exceptions, um, such as countries in the Middle East and Mongolia. Um, we're mostly seeing that people are doing research in their own backyards, so far less parachute science than we were anticipating. We also wanted to look at authorship trends in terms of gender expression. We know that women have been historically underrepresented in many STEM fields, so we wanted to assess if that uh, gap between authorship was still present. And what we found was that there was more male or uh, masculine pronoun use in first authors. But when we looked at senior authorship pronoun usage, we found that that gap between he, him users and she, her users was um, much greater in senior authorship positions than it was in first authorship positions. Now, what this tells us is that there is still a disparity between authorship um, in terms of gender expression in the field of climate change and infectious disease research. However, that gap could potentially be closing. We also looked at the institutions conducting research and overwhelmingly that was colleges and universities. So those secondary education institutions followed by governmental bodies. Um, this was somewhat surprising to us. We expected there to be a greater representation of governmental bodies doing research on climate change and infectious diseases due to the fact that many governmental bodies have to deal with the impacts of climate change on the public. Uh, however, there was again, more representation of colleges and universities. So what exactly did we find kind of in summary? Well, we know that geographic um, biases and both subject and taxonomic biases are present within the field of climate change and infectious disease research. Um, more research was occurring in temperate, well-developed areas and more research was being conducted on mammals and arthropods during this period. <clears throat> Now, when biases are present within a field, this inevitably leads to neglect, as many of you are aware. Um, and some neglected areas that we identified were developing countries, countries in tropical or subtropical areas, and countries that experience persistent geopolitical conflict were sometimes not well studied during this period or not studied at all during this period. So conclusively, we also identified some neglected disease systems during this period that were not well studied. Um, some of those are, again, those neglected tropical diseases that we are all so aware of here. These include parasitic infections, uh, directly transmitted diseases such as rabies, which is something that I study um, very closely, wildlife-borne pathogens, which is concerning because we know that many wildlife pathogens can spill over to livestock or to humans, causing disease emergence, which can lead to pandemic and also upper respiratory infections were not well assessed during this period. Um, however, there's one massive caveat there in that all of this data was um, collected prior to the COVID-19 pandemic or the, the uh, largest impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you were to assess um, climate change impacts on infectious disease research after the year 2020, I guarantee you there would be a larger emphasis on um, upper respiratory infections such as COVID-19. So definitively, there are some limitations and recommendations that we gleaned from this study. Um, first was that the English language required for publication could be a barrier, especially for some of the countries that we identified as being underrepresented. We also uh, wanted to point out that author interpretations of results could be biased or could be shaped by publication pressures. So what we found was that there was a, a large proportion of research that had statistically significant positive results associated with climate change and the disease system. Now this could be because there is a reticence to publish null or negative results within the field. Um, however, if we are not publishing those null or negative results, we're not getting a full picture of the current situation of climate change impacts on disease systems. Uh, so we want to be aware of that as a scientific field. 
We also wanted to call for an increase in collaboration, um, especially with countries that we identified as being underrepresented in this field, especially for those of us that do come from those well-studied, highly developed, higher GDP countries. Um, what we know is that when authors from underrepresented areas collaborate with or publish with authors from uh, more well-developed temperate areas, their publication rates go up. So as we work to make uh, publication and um, literature more equitable for people, it's important for us to collaborate with those groups so that their research can be uh, put out there. We also wanted to call for a more ecological model of health study rather than an anthropocentric one. Now, I know that that's somewhat counterintuitive because we're all here to um, assess and talk about uh, neglected tropical diseases that impact humans. Um, however, when we don't study the ecological impacts of uh, different vectors and wildlife species, we're missing part of the picture of potential spillover dynamics that could lead to the next pandemic. So if we're so overwhelmingly focused on humans that we miss the impacts of climate change on wildlife reservoirs, we're going to be left wrong-footed when um, the inevitable next spillover occurs. And with that, I would very much like to thank all of my collaborators at the Laboratory of Disease Ecology and Biogeography, my advisor, Dr. Luis Escobar, all of the other graduate students in my lab and our undergraduate researchers, the Virginia Tech College of Natural Resources and Environment, as well as the Translational Biology, Medicine and Health Program and our funding agencies. And just as a disclaimer, the opinions expressed here are those of me and my co-authors, not necessarily those of our funding agencies.